So now, um, another perspective on where we all are. I'd like to present um, uh, Professor Rafael Munoz de Basile Llorente um, from the University of Salamanca in Spain. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in sunny Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> and to tell you the truth, when I was invited, I thought that the place, the the, the event was going to take place in uh, in Athens. So I said, "Oh, great!" <laughs> <laughs> then I discovered it was Dublin. But I mean, the weather is really it's been really very nice. Lucky. Yesterday, I'm very, yeah, I'm very lucky. Uh, I'm going to um, make a hopefully, hopefully brief uh, account of uh, the situation in Spain. Uh, the title is Spain Adjustment Almost Without a Memorandum of Understanding. This is the only, uh, out of the three countries that we review this, uh, this morning, in this country, as you know, we are not formally in, uh, in the bailout, we are not formally under the, the control of the Troika, but that we had uh, a limited uh, intervention related to the financial system, well, about 40 billion uh, euros, uh, but uh, the memorandum of understanding just limited itself to the financial uh, system and although with some uh, elements related to um, uh, um, um, the economic environment related to the financial system. But it's not a, 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 a memorandum of understanding related to the country itself and to the whole variety of economic policies that we have seen in, in Greece or in Ireland. That is formally because my, my thesis, as we will see here, from a, a practical point of view, everything that has been going on in Spain since uh, 2010 um, follows very, very closely the policy that has been applied in another memorandum of understanding in Ireland or uh, Ch Cyprus of, uh, or Portugal, regardless of the um, differences in the economic problems in the Spain vis-à-vis -vis these other countries that we, have, that we have seen. I'm going to just focus very briefly what was the situation in Spain before the storm, before the crisis? Then uh, the two phases, there are very clear, two very clear phases of uh, economic policy in the crisis in Spain, one from 2009 to 2010, and then the other one from 2010 on. And this 2010 is not a change in government. There was not a change in government. We could see, we could, we could uh, um, fantasize that there, is, there, has, there was kind of a, almost like a coup d'etat without uh, a change in policy, without the change in government. And then two years later, there was a change in, in government, but not really that much change in policy. Maybe in the, in, in the in, in intensiveness of the policies, but not the policies itself. Uh, I'm going to dwell a little bit on the weak foundation of a harmon and Grafford policy, all this theory of expansionary austerity. Is there is a base for it from an economic theory point of view or from an empirical point of view? And then very briefly also economics and social consequences. And I think this is interesting. What are the two competing explanations behind the policy that is being applied? Because depending on whether the cause of the problems is one or the other, the policies might make more or less sense. And uh, I'm uh, just very briefly uh, the alternatives that is uh, something that we, we should discuss also. Well, first, what I first like to, to point out is that Spain was an economic example of uh, everything going all right, well, not everything, but m most of the um, um, major financial uh, equilibrium uh, indicators were doing, were, were fine in Spain before the crisis. As you can see, in terms Deficit. Spain had a, a surplus of uh, over 2%. Um, most countries in, the, in Europe were either in equilibrium or with a deficit. You have there just Germany and the UK and the average of the European Kingdom. So in terms of uh, financial situation, public financial situation, the situation was better than good and formally was better than good. Uh, in terms of debt, in terms of debt, uh, uh, the, the situation was also very, very good since uh, in 1995, the, 1996, the, we went through a process of decreasing of the, the um, percentage of public uh, in relation to GDP uh, down to slightly over one third of, of uh, GDP. And it was only after the crisis that there has been an increase. And, uh, and now, even after the huge increase during the crisis, in part due to the policies applied, 
if we are more or less in a situation uh, equivalent to to the EU EU average. So it was not a a, a, a problem of reckless spending by the the public sector. It was not a, po a problem. It, there was a problem, and we will see now that there is, there, there is a problem of, of debt, but certainly not a problem at that time, before the crisis, not a problem of public uh, sector debt. The level of expenditure of um, public expenditure on, uh, in relation to GDP was well below average. The level, the development of uh, the welfare state was late and is not a very, was not and is not a very generous welfare state in terms of uh, public social expenditure in relation to GDP it was around 20% uh, compared vis-a-vis 27% -vis, uh, the EU, EU average and up to 30% in France or in Sweden. So we are, it, it's really a very sober welfare state, it's not reckless spending. Um, uh, we, we, not only uh, public finance were all right, but uh, the situation of the country uh, was um, buoyant. Uh, I, huge increase, uh, a relative very high increase in terms of GDP. Spain was growing since the recession in 1993, was growing very, very rapidly compared to, to the rest of Europe, and a huge increase in employment. This is interesting because uh, uh, the, the Spanish labor market is the sick labor market in Europe, as you will see. But, uh, and it's supposed, allegedly, it's a very rigid labor market. Well, if it's rigid, it certainly is not rigid at the time of generating employment. It doesn't look like a rigid market where you can really generate employment at that, at that uh, rate of speed. Uh, just to put it in, uh, well, you, can, you have there the comparative uh, statistics with the EU 15. But uh, in terms of uh, total employment generated during this period, we about, it's, it's, nearly one th 30 percent of all employment created in Europe was created in Spain. So that was the time where people talk about Germany, about the sick country in Europe, and Spain was the, the, new, the new Germany, the new California, they like to say. Well, more than new California is turning to be the new Florida, but it's a different thing, you know. <laughs> um, now, with two, with two problems, um, very unbalanced growth, with a very important uh, role played by construction that uh, grew up to be up ten, uh, to, mess, to be almost uh, over 10 percent of, uh, of GDP compared to five six percent in the rest of Europe and one uh, up to one third of employees with temporary contract that was a time bomb I mean because it, it's that it was very easy to create jobs but it, these jobs uh, resulted very very also easy to to destroy uh, what was the problem? The problem was uh, uh, a discouraged performance of the foreign sector. As we can see, um, there is a, a missing, missing part of the light. Yeah, well, the Spain disappeared after 1995. That's interesting. Um, the red line is supposed to continue. And in uh, just to give you an idea, in 2007, this is falter, faltergeist. In 2007, uh, the um, uh, current account deficit as percent of the GDP was around 10%. I mean, everybody knew that. I, I remember conversation in 2004, 2005 with some colleagues from uh, one of them from the Bank of Spain, and they were completely uh, astonished by the degree of uh, the, the intensity of the foreign deficit at, that at that time was 4 or 5%, saying, and they, they, they say, this is a time bomb. This is a time bomb. This is not something new. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sorry because uh, you should see that from uh, 2000, uh, early 2000, you have an, uh, uh, an, an increase of the, of the deficit up to 10%, something like that. And now it's back to almost zero as a result of the recession. Um, this is not something new. No, this is, comp uh, this is weird. This is really weird because this, is the whole, this whole thing is moved. This, the red line should be here, uh, starting in uh, 1997, uh, excuse me. And uh, in, uh, in previous growth cycles, we always had a, pro a foreign sector problem, and we always had a deficit, but usually reaching 3 4% of, uh, of current account deficit, we had a foreign cri crisis, there was a devaluation, there was a short crisis, like in 1992-93, we had three devaluations in a row. There was, uh, and then 
uh, we regain uh, competitiveness through devaluation and uh, have solved partially at least for a time the foreign sector um, foreign sector prices then um, the all these uh, problems, all these problems with the foreign sector accumulated, and in 19, in 2007, 2008, there was the starting of the economic crisis. At the beginning, uh, it was no one recognized that uh, there was a crisis in Spain. I have here three quotes: uh, one from uh, uh, the director of the Department of Spanish uh, of the of research of the Spanish Central Bank saying that, the, well, that we never talk about the housing bubble, neither respect any other thing but a soft deceleration of prices. Uh, the Ministry of Economy, they also considered that, the, he also considered there was no problem with, uh, with the bubble. And I like this, my favorite is Angel Gurria, Secretary of State of the OCDE, saying the housing boom is turning into a landing much softer than in other places because there was no speculative bubbles. I mean, so far, so far, prices have come and dropped uh, f near 40%, and uh, the market has not recovered yet. I believe that in Ireland the market is recovering, in Spain it hasn't. And every other month we have the lowest amount of, uh, of uh, s uh, sold, uh, um, houses sold of uh, the history of uh, Spain, you know. And then, but I like the second part as, as much as the first part. Chapeau for the Spanish financial system that thanks to a competitive and serious work of the regulation, regulatory authorities seem to be doing better than in the rest of Europe. No, certainly, well, that was not so. Mm? And then, uh, there, uh, uh, in uh, 2008, there is a recognition, a recognition of, uh, uh, of the of crisis, and um, it's very interesting because the the respond, the first response is uh, the application of very resolute anti-cyclical Keynesian policy based on the standard pillars of allowing the stabilizer, automatic stabilizer to work through lower taxes and higher transfer, mostly unemployment benefits. Unemployment benefits were not reduced, and uh, the, the, uh, that was not the case in previous crises uh, in 1992-93. There was an ad hoc tax reduction that was not very intelligent, but we had but we had elections in 2008, and it was something that it was good, a reduction, a tax fl uh, a flat reduction of 400 uh, uh, euros uh, for everybody. Uh, and uh, an ad hoc expenditure program, uh, the so-called um, Plan E, which is altogether, altogether, <coughs> uh, the response. The, the um, um, we have uh, here, Spain is the, this one. I think we 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 launched the PDF. That way, it's not looking very well. Uh, uh, in between Luxembourg and, and Sweden, that's uh, Spain. Uh, in from a comparative perspective. The expansionary, the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus was in Spain higher than in any other country, even uh, including the U.S. in the in the sample. But of course, only if we look at 2009. If we, do, uh, if we look at the combined impact of 2009 and 2010, then things change. Why? Because in 2010, the, 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 there was a change in policy, and we turned from. Uh, very expansionary counter-cyclical policy following the dictum of the European Commission. The European Commission, that's what they said, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, memorandums and uh, information about it, although, I mean, they, 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 they pressed for uh, uh, a stimulus package financed by the national countries, not by the, by the European uh, Union, but that was their, their, their position. And in, in Next year, in, 2000, in, the, in, in 2010, there was big change in the uh, radical change in the policy uh, related to the deterioration of public finance. Obviously, if you are um, producing fiscal stimulus in a time of uh, recession, you are going to deteriorate your, your finance. That part of the that's part of the deal. That's that's the only way you can make expansionary policy uh, work. Otherwise, you would not have that expansionary impact in, on on demand. No? There was a, there is also a, the, obviously the European Central Bank was not helping uh, the, the 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 behavior of the bank as we all know was very pushy they act late and they act very little and that led to an increasing cost of public finance plus uh, the, if you, we add this increasing uh, cost of public finance plus the European Commission pressure that in 2010 changed its point of view and started giving priority to fiscal consolidation. 
and of course a very intense pressure of um, of the European Central Bank and I want to show you something I neatly prepared it with <coughs> links but they are the links are no I don't think are working so I'll have to move quickly through the presentation I want to show you this uh, in 2010 uh, the uh, Jean-Claude Trichet sent a personal letter to the president of the Spanish government, signed also by the president, the governor of the Spanish Central Bank, uh, saying, this is my translation of the letter, this letter has been um, uh, unknown to the general public, it was not released at the time, and it has been kept under the control of the president of government at the time, uh, Zapatero, who only released it as part of his uh, memoirs uh, book that he released last year, you know, and in uh, one of the appendix, you can go and have uh, access to this very important piece of information that was con uh, considered private and I, I, I got this through internet because uh, and, and it's a, a, a scan of the of the book it's not it's not in the uh, among the official documents of the Spanish government of the time and uh, you can see that we consider I mean the president of the Central European Central Bank which it has no uh, power to decide about economic policy of the member countries we consider necessary to adopt the following measures and uh, the f four letter pages i just translated a few few measures related to the labor market the labor market is out of the scope of the type of policies that the, the economic central bank should run or neither the uh, or the spanish central bank uh, and reinforce more the role of enterprise level agreements in order to guarantee the real decentralization of wage bargaining because i say so uh, as in uh, greece or in ireland as we we know and uh, eliminate the clauses of in the section of wages to inflation, uh, a sexual measure to promote wage moderation. This is interesting because all through the mm, first decade of this century, uh, there was an incredibly degree of wage moderation, almost stagnant or very low mm, growth in, in real wage. Considering that the Spanish economy was growing, I mean, while it was generating employment, as we saw very, very quickly, but wages were followed a policy of wage moderation backed by the two major trade unions because they thought that it was in, that was an important role. Uh, in ter in, it, the main problem was generation of the increase in employment. We had an, a problem of unemployment at that time too, and so that was something normal in the Spanish uh, business to have wage moderation uh, and. The adoption of a new exceptional labor contract with very low dismissal uh, dismissal cost, and there is a whole, a whole other uh, list uh, in relation to public expenditure and so on. This is almost a shopping list that if you review the one, two, uh, two major uh, labor for uh, labor um, regulation reform, labor market reform that have been approved since uh, uh, 2010. Almost every other thing is there. I mean, almost everything is there. Who, who is running? Who is running the European? Uh, who is running the Spanish uh, uh, economic policy? I mean, not even the European Commission. That maybe through you know the, the European semester has some uh, ways to. Also, in many cases, they are not in the treaties. But not the European Commission, not the Spanish government, but the European uh, European Central Bank. Um, so. Uh, it looks like the pressures were uh, too too intense to be uh, not to be followed. So there is a huge change in in the economic policy, uh, a huge change of priorities. And now the priorities are to, uh, the reduction of deficit, and you can see that. Just look at the red bars. That's the variation of public deficit in 2008 and 2009, and look 2010. That we have reduction 2011, and since then there have been a reduction on of uh, public expenditure and increase in uh, in taxes with the goal of redu reduction public deficit sometimes as it happened in ireland as the gdp is decreasing at the same time all this uh, uh, fiscal consolidation is not translated into real uh, reduction of public deficit in terms of gdp it, it is in absolute terms but not so much in terms of of gdp because it's a moving target. I mean, it's a moving target because the policy that you are applying, uh, we, uh, we will see, are affecting not only the, uh, uh, the nominator of the equation, the in, um, uh, revenue, public revenue and, and minus uh, expenditure, but also the denominator of the G GDP. Um, 
Now, um, what? Let, let's step back for a second. And what? What is? What? Is, what was the, the assumed economic uh, logic behind that change in policy? Oh, the, 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 the mantra in, in relation to these policies are the hypothesis of expansionary policy. And uh, it is supposed uh, you, uh, that if you uh, are able to reduce uh, expenditure and uh, mostly reduce public expenditure and also increase uh, uh, public revenue, th th that could uh, lead to uh, an increase of um, uh, effective demand through three different ways. Three, the rationale is, is a very diverse rationale because it's a, a rationale completely different from the Keynesian rationality that if you reduce public expenditure in a time of crisis, you are reducing, you are reducing uh, the only uh, source of effective demand. And of course, that is going to lead to a reduction in, in GDP. But the rationale is one is the an, an old rationality of this type of policy. The, the what in the time of the Great Recession they call the Treasury View, and in modern macroeconomic or modern, the 70s, 1970, 1980 macroeconomics was the idea of crowd, crowding out. As the government is competing with the private sector uh, to get finance, and of course. The more finance that go to the public sector, the less that is to the uh, private sector. So private private investment is going to be crowded out of the of the system by public uh, finance. And at the end, you are increasing one uh, uh, component of the effective demand. You are reducing the other one, and at the end, you don't have impact the the, the desired impact expansionary impact on GDP. Uh, of course. Maintain this. This would be true, or could be true, in a situation of growing GDP. GDP. But in a situation of recession, in a situation where not only uh, investment is not growing, but you have excess of capacity in Spain, at least you have uh, thirty percent excess of capacity. If you measure, the, you have problem measuring excess of capacity. But I think the proper measurement of excess of capacity would locate the um, uh, the excess of capacity in around 50 60 percent uh, um, around 50 percent right? so if you have excess of capacity you are not going to have investment even if they, you have uh, finance for that and that was not the, the situation then also the the so-called the uh, recarian equivalence theorem is another uh, way to another possibility to explain how uh, fiscal consolidation could lead to uh, increase in uh, in GDP, or at least uh, could be done without decreases in the in GDP, without uh, increasing further the recession. The idea of the uh, recurrent equivalent theorem is uh, very dear to the economists. The idea, very simply explained, is that well, uh, mm, people know that if you uh, spend more than you are, if the public sector spend more than what is getting. Uh, through uh, re public revenue, an increase in deficit would mean in the future an increase in taxes in order to pay for the debt. So, from a rational, uh, almost economic point of view, what I'm going to do is increase my saving now in order to be ready to pay for uh, higher taxes in the future. So, the extra increase by the public sector is going to be compensated by extra savings by uh, citizens in order to compensate for public uh, for future public um, uh, taxes increases well that, that's uh, that's the recurrent uh, equivalent theorem i don't uh, my friends don't i don't know your friends but my friends the people i know don't behave on that uh, through don't follow that coordinates when when uh, in their daily behavior financial behavior no? and then is of course the the confident theory and the other two um, uh, perspectives have some theory behind this thing about the confidence theory, theory in the in the terms of uh, the, the Krugman. Uh, that's how, how Krugman called call it. Uh, it's it's completely theoryless. I mean, th there is no theory behind. The idea is that reducing fiscal consolidation will lead to an improvement of confidence by firms and consumers that will counteract the depressive uh, impact of fiscal consolidation itself. Mm? So everybody is going to be more happy and uh, go into a spendthrift behavior, firms and uh, and consumers. Well, that's that, that that's uh, really stupid from a theoretical point of view, not saying that expectations are not important, but not that type of expectation. But 
if you go through the Trichet or Draghi or some of our um, uh, leaders' uh, um, declaration in public, they m continuously are making reference to this confidence. We have to regain the confidence of the market. And if we regain the confidence of the market, everything is going to be turned around and we will start growing again. And right now in Spain, that Spain is supposed to be in a process of recovery, right now what they say is that we regain the confidence of the market and that's why everything is starting to look better. So obviously that the, the, uh, there is another explanation in relation to the debt. I'm not going to get into that because it has been already discredited by some further analysis. Uh, but what was the result? The result, it didn't work. I mean, clearly, the, th the theory of um, uh, expansionary uh, austerity doesn't work. Um, it's, it, it, the, 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 the empirical analysis of the 90s was very simple and methodological, uh, um, was not, it had a lot of flaws, but in, now we are seeing in this crisis that it has not worked. You have, you, you have a, here a very clear picture of what, how the, the, the double group recession, the recession of 2011 and 2012 and 13, has been economic policy made, has been man-made. Uh, the, the, the compensatory policies, Keynesian policy, were working and it was a very uh, big drop, but it, it lasted just for one year. And as the economy was coming out, both in Spain and in, um, in Europe, the change in economic policy, yes, made the economy go back into, re drop the economy back into recession. So that's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's clear in every single country that you look at. Um, it didn't work. I mean, it didn't work. Uh, economic expansionary uh, uh, austerity didn't work. And it didn't solve the, as uh, Rari's college mentioned, it didn't solve the problems of uh, financing. The financing sector were not buying that policies because what we have, the change in policies 2010, uh, May 2010, and from then on, what well, we have is a huge increase in uh, country risk. This is the, the difference between, uh, I think it's a 10 years bond from Germany and, and, and Spain. And it, we see it go from two, uh, around 200 basic points to 600 basic points, six percentage points. So it didn't, it didn't solve the problem that they, uh, they tried to solve with uh, the fiscal consolidation to maintain access to the market. In, a, in the Spanish case, we maintained the access to the market. We were able to, they were able to finance uh, the finance, uh, the renovation of debt, but at a very, very high cost. Also in terms of deficit, that is also increasing the Spanish deficit. And, but there was no recognition, there has not been recognition of the mistake made. And every other, these are the forecast of um, there's some very my very famous graphs a forecast of the Spanish Commission the fall economic forecast of since starting in 2007 until 2000 and, and uh, it's 12, 12 part of the the uh, uh, graph is missing but as you can see that they were every other year they expect to be a recovery Every other year, they expect that the drop is going to stop and the measures of uh, fiscal consolidation are going to lead to a uh, process of uh, regrowth, regaining the, the, the confidence of the economy. It didn't happen. It didn't happen in Spain. It didn't happen in Portugal. It didn't happen in Ireland. And of course, and this is just incredible, it didn't happen in, in, in Greece. I mean, I could paint right now. You want to know next year forecast. I mean, you just have to paint another one going a little bit down and then back again. They were extremely confident <coughs> on their impact of their policy. S and, but so confidence year after year. And when somebody is confident year after year that your girlfriend is going to love you finally, then <laughs> you have a problem of, uh, of, of, of dealing with reality. I mean, your theory is not working. It's interesting because the only institution, that uh, international institution, that had recognized that there was something wrong with the forecast was the, is the uh, International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary, Monetary Fund with Oliver Blanchard yes, uh, published a mea culpa paper, very technical paper, uh, evaluating uh, an evaluation report of the fiscal adjustment in the IMF supported programs. 
and and they they confronted that problem. Uh -uh. Every other year, we are considering our for we are failing our forecast. There must be something wrong. With what was wrong with the model? What they say was wrong with their models? Multipliers. They were using a multipliers, fiscal multipliers of 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is. It doesn't mean that there is no uh, span, uh, expansionary impact of uh, of um, uh, fiscal policy or contractionary impact of uh, uh, fiscal adjustment, but it's only half of what you are reducing. Reducing. What they are saying is that in times of recession, they consider that multipliers are now closer. They could be even closer to two, which is obviously that you are generated twice the impact, negative impact. Of what you are cutting in in uh, in public uh, public deficit in terms of uh, uh, loss of uh, of GDP. Well, and uh, this explain that these are the estimates of the impact of fiscal consolidation in a whole bunch of countries. The second one, uh, I think, is uh, the second well, is Portugal or Greece. I think Greece was the third one. In any case, we focus on Spain. I mean, it's not something specific for Spain in, in, in every country. But if we focus for, uh, 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 in Spain, if we look at the Spanish data, that means that in 2011, all the most, the all of the reduction in GDP was created by fiscal policy. Without that, we have been growing around one percent, exactly what we are growing next year. It's interesting this this year. We are growing this year, and as you know, there has been a rescheduling or reduction of debt in, in the case of Spain, postponing the 3% uh, uh, deficit goal. And in 2012, almost a point and a half, more than what we decrease the Spanish economy, the decrease in the GDP in the Spanish economy. So that's why I say that this second dip has been man made, has been economic policy made, uh, and economic policy, I mean EU made, mm? EU, IMF, whatever. Um, but the, I said the, the IMF recognized the mistakes and changed his, uh, his estimate, not the European Commission. The European Commission wrote two and a half pages, one box in a report saying, well, uh, uh, multipliers are positive and near to in other countries, but not in Europe. Because, of course, we have taken into account the impact of financial markets. And then they say, well, maybe the, the policy, the, the reasons behind the policy were wrong, but not the policy itself. Because even if the impact is not uh, expansionary, even if we cannot grow out of the crisis through uh, fiscal consolidation, there is no other choice because the alternative of risking or rising uh, risk premium and higher borrowing costs would make it impossible. But, but you, are, you, are, yeah, you are changing your discourse. This is not serious. I mean, if that's the problem, then you have to face a situation of what do we have to, where do we look for an alternative source of finance? And there, I mean, there is the European Central Bank that could explore, it has hundreds and or tens of very well-trained economies that could explore technical ways to generate that finance when the market is not work working. When I was studying uh, public finance in the 70s, I was taught by very orthodox professors that the state has to, the public sector has to step in when something is not working in the public, in the, in the market. I mean, if the uh, financial, international financial market is not working, is not financing something that you know should be financed because the alternative it works in terms of GDP loss and in terms of uh, uh, creation of uh, generational unemployment, then you should develop ways of solving this until the financial market starts working again. Uh, the impact, well, I'm not going to dwell on the impact, but I, I want just you to focus on this. This is something unseen in the rest of the countries. In Spain, we have a reduction of 7.6% uh, of GDP, which is a major reduction, but I mean, it's not the end of the world. I mean, you, you, you could, I mean we all could handle a reduction of 7% of our, our income. Hmm? Uh, the reduction in employment was 17.8. That's more or less the same impact on employment, but in, in, in Greece, the GDP dropped 20%. So j just imagine the sensitivity, the elasticity of employment, employment to GDP in Spain. And they talk about a rigid labor market. Come on, 
rigid labor market you have that you, uh, my, my impression is that we have the, the opposite problem we have an extremely sensitive labor market and very easy way to adjust to the cycle and that make it very a very dangerous economy a, a, a very moody economy um, there is an increase in unemployment from 70 to 26 percent 40 percent among uh, non-eu immigrants so the impact in the distributed uh, perspective is different I have to say that this is also, in terms of comparison with Portugal or with Greece, it's different, the, or Ireland is different. Portugal now has an unemployment rate of 17%, I think, and that's something unheard of uh, in, in Portugal. Not in Spain. We had 25% in 1992 or 93. We, have, uh, we had 20% uh, in uh, 85. So, I mean, the, 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 the country is not that it's... I wouldn't say that it's prepared to deal with that, but it's used to deal with high levels of unemployment. Not, that's not the case in, of, in, in Greece or in other countries. Uh, and the usual, the usual impacts that I'm not, go, not going to dwell on. One thing, uh, Spain has turned into the second more unequal country of, the, of Europe after Latvia. And this is the uh, 2000 and, uh, 12 data, but correspond to 2011 because the way this data is collected in, in Europe. Uh, so, I most probably by now the the, the inequality Gini index will be over 25 percent, 35 percent. Increasing poverty rates. This has just monetary poverty rates rates from 19 percent to 22 percent. And I would call the I would like to call the attention here. Three minutes. Okay, uh, to one thing that. For me, the important uh, uh, the the importance of this number is not so much the 22 percent, but the 19 percent, almost 20 percent before the crisis. Obviously, obviously, the crisis had an impact on poverty rate, but after 10 years, the, the incredible thing for me is that after 10, 15 years of very high growth, the California of Europe had a Poverty rate of, 20, of almost 20%. Of course, it's relative poverty rate, but the poverty rate, nevertheless, is how we measure in, in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, different changes, reduction in public expenditure, pension reform, and this is a major change, not inflation protected. Public pension, for now on, are not by law inflation protect, protected. So you will have a deterioration of uh, the, the pensions in real terms, very very quickly if politicians decide to do so because now they are not obliged to to compensate for for inflation a polarization of job structure too because the destruction of jobs this total destruction of jobs during the crisis 2011 2013 8 and 10 and as uh, you can see in terms of uh, quantiles of jobs the first quantiles low quality jobs the, the last the fifth quantiles high quality jobs as you can see, the destruction has concentrated in the middle, uh, lower middle jobs, not so much in the in the upper jobs. Um, in order to just just to finish, behind this policy, this policy of uh, uh, empowerment of, of the working population, that's the, the, uh, a, a policy of uh, uh, domestic deflation, deflation is a poverty, a, a policy of impoverishment of uh, working population. There are, there are two possible ways to explain the crisis in the, in the, of the Spanish economy. One way is to explain it as a problem of north-south imbalance uh, produced by strong uh, demand growth in the south, in the periphery, financial integration and low interest rate and very low growth in the north. So all the finance went from the north to the south when it was demanded. But the other way, and then you have uh, the, the, the foreign account uh, disequilibrium is a problem of this disequilibrium in finance going from the north to the south. The other point of view is uh, the loss of, co of competitiveness in the periphery due to wage growth higher than productivity growth. And, and of course, uh, depending on whether you believe one way or the other, one explanation or the other explanation, the policy is different. In this case, you might have to reconduct uh, wages in the other in the other in the in, in the other situation or or in the other explanation and doesn't back that type of policies no and um, for and this will be I will finish with this 
Uh, there is a very recent paper uh, by the IMF too, uh, tracking the causes of eurozone external imbalances, new evidences, is an econometric paper trying to uh, deal with this issue, whether one explanation or the other explanation is better to explain, has more explaining power. And their result is that um, in terms of uh, the mm, uh, variation in current account, the most important variables that explain the variation of current account results in the South are real interest rate and real GDP growth. The unit labor cost, the increase in unit labor cost, has a very low explanatory po uh, uh, power. It explains very little of the change of the behavior of current account balances. So the problems are in the macro. And the problems are in the macro, meaning a li we could, for, for, from the macro uh, perspective, the problems re relate to a uh, um, not complete and not very uh, sophisticated construction of the European monetary system. That didn't uh, account for the type of problems that could happen when you have a single financial market, but you don't have means to compensate, control uh, the imbalance created by that uh, uh, single financial and monetary market. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.